Well, good afternoon, everyone. So nice to be here with you. Now, it's not the whole world. It's only one third. <laughs> well, it's uh, a great opportunity to, uh, uh, to visit uh, headquarters here again, to visit with Charlotte, in Charlotte. Uh, we uh, have had a chance to have some meetings, and uh, um, I made one telecast. I'd hoped to make two, but uh, I just wasn't prepared for the second one, so I asked uh, Mr. Ames uh, if I could uh, postpone that, so uh, we'll do that. <laughs> I think I should bring you up to date with some of my visits in the last two months. Uh, January the 23rd, uh, my wife and I made a trip to uh, South Africa. Uh, where we uh, took the um, annual general meeting of the board in South Africa and I conducted a two-day conference with the ministers. We've got some excellent men and women in the church in South Africa. Frankly, uh, events of uh, just prior to the feast last year uh, were quite traumatic. But what's come out of it is we've uh, found men and women of great character, of great experience, of humility, who are now in charge of the work in South Africa. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Peter van der Beer and his wife, uh, Pat. Uh, my wife and I were at college with Pat. Uh, we both graduated in 1973 from Brickett Wood. And uh, she went back to South Africa. We went to Australia and she married uh, Mr. van der Beer. And uh, he was ordained soon after as an elder. So he's been an elder for over 30 years. And so we've asked him to take on the responsibility of being the area pastor. We also have now taken care of the office, Mr. and Mrs. Christo Burta. And they are doing an excellent job operating out of their house, uh, mailing out the literature, uh, handling all of the requests, and uh, also just doing an excellent job with the finances and everything else. I, I just uh, couldn't be more pleased. Uh, than with the people we have there, and then very two fine uh, elders there, uh, Mr. L uh, Louis M uh, Bauer uh, in Johannesburg and uh, in the Rand uh, area, and then, uh, then also down in um, Port Elizabeth, Mr. Mansi Bauer. So we're very grateful for what God has done in South Africa. Uh, from there we went to, I went, my wife went back to England, and I went on to Tanzania, and uh, met with uh, our man there, Mr. Jerome Chembe. Uh, he lives in Dar es Salaam, and uh, I had the chance to baptize three people uh, the first night I got there, uh, very fine people, uh, very faithful, very committed to God's truth and God's way. Uh, I wrote a, uh, uh, a postcard to my granddaughter uh, the next, at the airport on my way to Nairobi, and I got one with giraffes on it. And on the postcard, I said, uh, well, I'm off to Nairobi tomorrow, Ella. I said, maybe I'll see some giraffes. We say giraffes, but I'll say giraffes for your benefit. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to Nairobi and uh, stayed overnight. And the next day, we drove 400 kilometers out west to Lake Victoria. And on the way, we were going through the Maasai country. And I looked up and there was a giraffe or giraffe, <laughs> a giraffe. And there was another one, and another one. So we stopped the car and we got out. There were 13 giraffe, all just grazing. And this is in the wild. This is not some game reserve or, well, I didn't have to pay any money <laughs> to go into the Serengeti or to anywhere. And it was just a wonderful experience. So I went to get my camera, but my wife had taken it back to England. <laughs> Uh, you know how it is when you're, you're packing and unpacking all the time? And so that's what happened. We drove a little further on and uh, the roads are very, very uh, potholed and uh, bumpy. And we got to the end of a really particularly bad stretch and I thought I could see the, the road on was quite clear without potholes, but we hit a particularly bad one. Bang! And about 100 meters or 200 meters down the road, found ourselves with a flat tire. So the driver changed the wheel, put the new wheel on and got back into the car. He said, well, I'm glad we got the flat tire here. I said, why? Oh, he said, this tribe are peaceful. <laughs> he said, the next ones, he said, they have AK-47s. 
And he said, we not, might not have been so uh, pe peaceful and happy and secure and safe. So it just shows uh, what it's like. So we got out to Lake Victoria and visited with, uh, I think I must have overall with the d different Bible studies visited about 140 people on that trip. But it was interesting. Um, <clears throat> then we uh, came back, I came back to, to London and uh, I've been doing a lot of visiting uh, in uh, the UK, uh, England, Scotland and, and Ireland and uh, a little, a few visits to Europe but not a great deal. Um, so we've certainly been, uh, been busy and enjoying it greatly and I thought I'd just give you a few statistics. In the UK and, and uh, Ireland we've had four baptisms in the last uh, three months. Uh, which is really great. Our income has particularly increased. We've had about a 700% increase in co-worker and donor income. People just sending money to us uh, from the, because they get the television, they get the uh, Tomorrow's World. Uh, at the end of 2005, we had 5,200 people uh, receiving Tomorrow's World. We now have 13,500. And that's due to the telecast. The fact that we have had been on Inspiration Channel and the Gospel Channel, because we're no longer on Inspiration, uh, but uh, it's really encouraging. And people are making very, very good comments about the programs. Uh, they love what they hear, uh, what they see, and they love the literature. And uh, it's just so good to see God's work progressing and going forward in, as Mr. Meredith calls it, the mother country. And uh, we're excited about that. Glad to be a part of it and uh, glad to be able to serve. So that's the, uh, the update that I wanted to bring you and uh, I hope that uh, some of you can get a chance to get to maybe France for the feast. I should give that Mr. Rapati and is that right? We should give that a bit of a plug and also maybe some of you uh, are thinking of going to Ireland. <clears throat> Well, talking about Europe, if we were living in Europe in the 16th century, we would be very careful how we practiced our beliefs. If you were a member of God's church in the 15th and the 16th century in Europe, in particular parts of Europe, you would be very careful how you practiced your religion and what you believe. Why do I say this? Well, in Spain in particular, in the 15th and the 16th centuries, the Holy Office, otherwise known as the Inquisition, the Holy Office had agents out around all parts of Spain, Portugal, uh, back in Italy they had uh, uh, priests and uh, ministers uh, that were doing their work. And so there was a period of time uh, soon after 1492 1492 for you is when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? But back in Spain, it was the year that every uh, Jew and Muslim was told to get out of the country. And they were given a date to get out, and they either converted to Catholicism or they were killed if they did not leave. It was very serious. And then in the ensuing years that came, those who had converted from Judaism or the Muslim faith to Christianity, they could not afford to practice their old faith. And so it was that the Catholic Church instituted a policy. In fact, they sent out an edict in many parts of Seville and Granada and uh, Cordova and other parts of Spain warning every citizen that if they did not report any person that they knew of who kept the Sabbath, who kept the Passover and the days of unleavened bread, if they did not report them to the authorities, they did so with great risk to their own life. And so people would report on their neighbors who kept the Sabbath or the holy days. And those that were reported were brought in before the tribunal of the Holy Office of the Inquisition.
They were interrogated, they were tortured, and if they did not recant and confess that they were a Christian or a Catholic, if they would not do that, then they were taken to a place called the Alto de Fe. That is the act of faith where they were brought and burnt at the stake. Some were fortunate that uh, they would be garroted beforehand, that is, strangled. But many people died at the stake for what they believed in keeping the Sabbath and the holy days. Right? So we live in a country of great freedom and we should never take for granted the wonderful privileges that we have to keep our faith and practice our religion in, uh, in complete freedom. <clears throat> Now, why were these people burnt at the stake? Because according to the Catholic Church, they were heretics. Now, you might uh, have heard that word heretic or heard the word heresy, but it probably doesn't have much of an impact upon you, does it? You think, well, I've heard of heres heretics in the past and I've heard of heresy. But I'm going to ask you a question. Could you or I be a heretic? Could we be guilty of heresy? Let's have a look at a scripture here in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're all familiar with verse 19 where we have listed here what are called the works of the flesh. And as we start to read this list of the works of the flesh, we clearly understand that the first ones are most definitely sinful and something which we would agree as something we should not be doing and we know uh, that is just not God's way. In fact, it says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, or witchcraft, as it says in the old King James, hatred. Wow, now hang on, we're starting to get into some things that, that we as human beings do. Hatred, contentions, that is arguments. That's where you're fighting with someone. Jealousies. And have you ever been jealous? Yes. Outbursts of wrath. Selfish ambitions. Dissensions. And look at the next one. Heresies. One of the works of the flesh is heresy. So what is heresy? Well, I phoned a, up a good friend of mine who uh, went to his Webster's Dictionary, and he gave me the definition. Listen to this, the definition from Webster's Dictionary of heresy. A religious belief opposed to the orthodox doctrines of a church, especially such a belief specifically denounced by the church and regarded as likely to cause schism or divisions. Now you think to yourself, well, I'm not, I'm not a heretic. I don't do that. And I'm sure that's the case. However, let me say that this is one of the works of the flesh. And I'm going to explain to you why it is so easy for we, as, us as human beings to be even just a little heretical. I'm going to explain it to you this way. In all of the works of the flesh, when you read through them, they all arise from self-centeredness. Whether it be an adultery, fornication, well, let's read them again. It says selfish ambitions, dissension. Look at verse 21, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries and the like. You see, all of these things come from our inner carnal nature and our heart. And heresy is one of them. And I'm going to give you the antidote. I'm going to give to you the way that you can ensure that you will not be heretical in your thinking. Because there is a danger for all of us to run off with our own opinions, our own religious ideas and thoughts, or to listen to another person who has their own religious you know, thoughts and ideas or doctrinal thoughts and ideas. I think once we become aware that it's a danger, we'll be on guard. And that's the purpose of this split sermon. <clears throat> so let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
and verse 26, and we start to learn a most important point here. We're all familiar with the scripture where it says, for you see your calling. I don't know whether we see it sometimes that way, but God, when He calls us, He actually reaches down into our mind and takes a hold of our mind and puts His truth into our mind. It's a miracle. It is not just us reading tomorrow's world or reading a booklet or talking with a minister and we come to an understanding through our own intellect. The way we come by the truth is that it is miraculously or a miraculous divinely revealed knowledge. Now we're not aware of it at the time. We think we think to ourselves, well, this is interesting. Wow, look at that. I've never noticed that before in the Bible. You've all had that experience, right? But were you aware of the fact that it was actually God opening your mind miraculously? It was, it was something which didn't happen through your own intelligence or intellect or wisdom or understanding. And I think once we understand that, it makes God's truth precious. It makes our calling precious holy and it makes it something that we do not want to lose or mess with. We don't want to mess with the truth by going off to the internet and and reading some newfangled idea that someone's got about this particular aspect of doctrine. We just have to be careful brethren and treasure that pearl of great price and hold on to the truth. It's not a truth, it is the truth. And so once we understand that, we can grow in understanding in a godly way. Look what it says here in chapter 2 verse 1. Paul said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the foundation of the understanding that we have. Verse 4, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now let me explain something about Paul. He had the capacity to actually speak with the wisdom of men. He spoke probably five languages. He had training at the feet of Gamaliel. He was an intelligent, erudite, sharp, smart person. But he counted that all as nothing and humbled himself under God and came with a simplicity to those to whom he spoke. And then verse 5, why? that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And then we go on in verse 10, But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Brethren, you know what? You don't have to have a high IQ to be in God's church. What you need is a high SQ, spiritual quotient. Not intelligent quotient. And you need a a high HQ, humility quotient. All right? And then God's truth can work in your mind. In fact, frankly, Intelligence and relying on human intelligence can sometimes, if we're not careful, limit our capacity. I'm not saying that intelligent people can't be called. Please don't misunderstand. But God's Spirit is different to the Spirit of this world. So God's truth was divinely revealed to us. In the living church of God, we have a statement of beliefs which is a clear, concise expression of what we as a church teach and believe. It has been crafted by God's 
faithful ministers, men who have known the truth over many years. And Mr. Meredith has seen to it that the wording takes into account every aspect of the truth that we have, and so we have our statement of beliefs. And I'm going to ask a question of you, how many of you have read it? Okay, don't, don't put your hands up, but if you have, <laughs> fine. I'm, I'm encouraging us all to study the statement of beliefs and to be sure that we agree with them because that is going to be a great help to make sure that we are not heretical. Have you noticed what happens to those who despise and reject the truth? Have you met a person five, ten years after they left the church and you say to them, well, we're off for the Feast of Tabernacles. The what? And they've forgotten the Feast of Tabernacles. It's incredible. You mentioned some of the truths that, that we hold dear and they no longer respect them. So let's be frank, brethren. We cannot tamper with the truth. It's precious. It is holy and it is a divine gift. Now, I'm not trying to say that we should not ever study other literature or, you know, read Bible aids or, you know, even take an interest in, in some things on the internet. Now, there are times where the internet is very helpful. I know, for example, uh, in preparing telecasts, uh, we use, I use Wikipedia <laughs> to get some facts, and uh, it's, it's, it's great. But we need to understand that we need to be careful with what we read and what we study. Frankly, the ministry are so cautious and careful that before we speak, we'll often ask uh, Mr. Ames or Mr. Meredith or others, well, what will I, if I speak on this, is that appropriate? Because we don't want to speak something which is not correct. In the latest issue of Tomorrow's World, there's an article here entitled, Your Magnificent Future. Mr. Meredith says, I was taking graduate classes in theology conducted by Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong, one of the most remarkable teachers of our time. One day he said, fellows, something has been coming strongly to my mind that seems almost heretical. <laughs> Obviously, I don't want to teach or believe anything that is wrong or heretical. But this new understanding seems to leap right out of the Bible itself and it's something mainstream religionists and philosophers have never understood. Yet, Mr. Armstrong continued, if any of you graduate students can prove to me out of the Bible that this remarkable new understanding is wrong, please do so. You see the attitude? Excellent attitude. In fact, I ask you to research this matter over the next several weeks as we must be sure to teach only what the Bible actually says. And so uh, that's exactly what they did. And the, the, the remarkable or the wonderful thing that Mr. Armstrong had come to understand uh, came from Colossians 1.26. The Apostle Paul wrote of the mystery which had been hidden from ages but now had been revealed to his saints. And that mystery is the glory of the, the mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are the only church that teaches and understands and believes that we are ultimate, ultimately to become members of the family of God, sons and daughters in His family with the glory and the power of God and we will be like Jesus Christ. No one else teaches that. And that is the great mystery and that was what Mr. Armstrong, when he under, started to understand it, realized that he had to be careful that it was not heresy. So over the years, I think we can understand that there are some things that we can do to ensure that we are not heretical. The first thing is stick to the basics. Or we used to say, you know, stay close to the trunk of the tree. Uh, and it really is true. I, I always think that at this point, we've got so much to read in our, of our own literature, I don't really see why we should have to go somewhere else to find other literature. There's enough of our own good literature to read and we should be doing that. So stick to the trunk of the tree. The second point, avoid heresy and heretics. Why flirt with spir spiritual adultery? You know, none of us would go to a pornographic site on the internet. Well, why would we go to 
spiritual pornography, you know, if you want to put it that way. So we need to just be careful. I, look, please, there's a balance on this. I don't want to say that you should never, ever read, you know, some things on the internet. You know, as long as you've got a, 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 a humble frame of mind that you, you understand what I've said about the truth that we so, you know, jealously guard and, and, and protect, you can go and, and read what other people say. But be careful. That's what I'm saying. In fact, uh, I was thinking about it during the week. I think it's interesting that they should call it the World Wide Web. Do you know why? Because if you get into it, you could be bitten by the spider. You could be bitten by the spider. So be careful, I say to all of us. Be careful. So avoid heresy and heretics. There's plenty of room for exciting Bible study. There's plenty of room for reading, you know, literature. We can add to our knowledge, but we must be careful not to be drawn away from the trunk of the tree. <clears throat> the third point and last point is this. Associate with spiritually sound, balanced people in the church. Make sure that you... you, you, you you fraternize, you, you talk with, you keep in touch with people who are, and especially those of you who are new in the church. And I'm going to explain something that I've noticed over the years. And it's a sad thing. In some con congregations, not every congregation, but I've noticed in some, we sometimes have a person who's an, a self-appointed teacher. And after services, <laughs> these are the people that will come up to mostly new people and they won't discuss things. They will assume a superior position of teacher. <laughs> Real good rule of thumb is this. <clears throat> if you find someone trying to teach you, but the ministry hasn't asked them to give sermonettes or sermons or, or whatever, then just simply ask the question, should they be teaching? And I've noticed that some of these so-called teachers, these self-appointed teachers, will not talk with long-term members because they won't get anywhere. So they come around to the new people and want to talk with them. So once again, I'm not trying to make it hard for everyone. I'm trying to give a balanced approach and so that we can understand that we should not be a heretic ourselves, but also be, be cautious and be careful uh, with what you hear and to whom you speak. So, you know, I'm not on a witch hunt, <laughs> but uh, let's just have a balance on this one. So we may ask the question again, am I potentially heretical? <laughs> and the answer is no. If you stick to the basics and maintain doctrinal purity, if you study our literature, the statement of beliefs, study your Bible, that's the best place to be studying God's Word. Secondly, avoid heresy and heretics. And thirdly, associate with spiritually sound-minded people. And if we do that, we will be safe and God can look after us and protect us. So let's maintain a spiritual humility. And I'd like to close with Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. You know, Titus was a young minister being sent by the Apostle Paul to take care of the church on the island of Crete. And this is what Paul said to Titus. He said in verse 11 of chapter 2, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify him for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That's what we should be looking for and be careful not to be a heretic. Well, greetings to all our brethren around the world and to all our guests here in Charlotte. 
We're enjoying a beautiful Sabbath day. Uh, spring has given us a beautiful introduction here locally, even though it went down to 34 degrees last night. Uh, daffodils are springing up all over, and uh, pear tree blossoms are just radiating all up and down the street and around the building here. And soon we'll see the redbud trees, the uh, crepe myrtles, and then following that, uh, we will have the beautiful cherry blossom trees along Crown Center Drive, which are just uh, always glorious around this time of year. And of course, these blossoms signal that the Passover is near, just uh, two weeks from tomorrow night. We'll be observing the Passover. When we consider the world's population of six and a half billion people, we realize that relatively few on the face of the earth observe the true Passover. And Jesus said in Matthew 26 and verse 28, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And when the disciples ate of the bread and they drank of the wine in the first New Testament Passover, they confirmed their acceptance of Christ's shed blood and His forthcoming sacrifice. They also demonstrated their commitment to Him in, as servants of Christ. So as we prepare for the Passover, what commitments will you make to God our Father and to our Savior Jesus Christ? I'd like you to consider seven commitments that we should consider as our Passover commitments. What is a commitment? Webster says, quote, to pledge or assign to some particular course or use. We pledge to be faithful in our relationship with God. A covenant is a formal binding agreement. It's a compact. And so I'll buy our baptism before the Passover, whenever we were baptized, we demonstrated our acceptance of the new covenant terms. We demonstrated our repentance and our faith in Christ's sacrifice. Dr. Meredith wrote an article, actually it was the lead article in the November-December 2005 Tomorrow's World magazine entitled, A New Covenant. Let's turn to Hebrews, the eighth chapter, Hebrews 8. And Jesus instituted the terms of the New Covenant at that first Passover, that He changed the symbols from the Old Testament Passover to the New Testament Passover. Hebrews, the eighth chapter, Hebrews 8. We are blessed to be pioneers of the New Covenant. We are members of the New Covenant. Hebrews 8, starting here in verse 6, Hebrews 8 and verse 6, but now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, speaking of Christ, which was established upon better promises. The old covenant had the promises of success, of prosperity, but not eternal life. And these are better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Uh, the covenant wasn't the problem, it was with the people, because they had carnal nature. So it goes on to say in verse 8, For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And that will happen after Christ returns. But we are pioneers of the new covenant because we are demonstrating how God is writing His laws on our hearts and on our minds. As he goes on to say in verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Eternal, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. He shows us how to love God, how to love our neighbors, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. For they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. So that's the time we look forward to. Mr. Meredith, in his article, A New Covenant, writes after that, verse 10. I'll just read uh, his um, insertions here, of verse 10. For this is the covenant, that is, the relationship with God, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws, 
that is, divine ethical standards of conduct, in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, that is, a genuinely righteous nation. And Mr. Meredith writes, This powerful New Testament verse makes it very clear that far from doing away with God's law, the New Covenant validates God's laws by putting them right into the minds and hearts of true Christians. How could it be otherwise? So very plain and clear to all of us, but I know that article um, when it was featured just about a year and a few months ago uh, helped people. We had quite a few positive comments on that article. The people realized, well, the New Covenant does not do away with God's law, but it is a formal agreement. And we are renewing that or and acknowledging our acceptance of Christ's sacrifice and that covenant when we take the Passover. We renew the formal binding agreement, the, pon the compact, the pledge, the covenant, the agreement that we made at baptism. Now, one way to effectively prepare for the Passover is to consider the commitments that we would make for the Passover or should make. What will you pledge to do with your life? What have you determined to do with your calling? How will you respond to God's love for the rest of your life? I want to give you those seven commitments to consider for the Passover. Number one is to be willing to accept God's forgiveness and forgive others. Turn to 1 John, the first chapter. Be willing to accept God's forgiveness and forgive others. Now, you would think that some would not have a problem of accepting God's forgiveness, but some do, because they can never work through the guilt feelings that they have. I used to, uh, I think I've mentioned to you before, sometimes I have a guilt feeling and I don't know why. Why do I feel guilty? And I have to examine myself and realize, oh, I, I, I realize why I feel funny is because I was watching television and I should have been reading the Bible and that's why I have this uh, guilty feeling. And so you have to identify the source of guilt and acknowledge it and God will help you. Uh, that's part of the process that we've heard in the sermons already in examining ourselves for the, the Passover so we understand what we need to repent of and what we need to change. But 1 John 1 verse 9 is such a powerful verse, a wonderful benefit and blessings. 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins. Now who in the world has not confessed his sins or her sins? Now that's a part of a true Christian's practice. It's a part of your daily and my daily life. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What an incredible promise, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I still remember coming up out of the water when I was baptized and, and realizing all my past sins are forgiven. I'm pure. I'm clean. I'm forgiven. I hope all of you felt that way uh, when you were baptized. But it, what cleanses us, of course, he mentions here in verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. So we need to be willing to accept God's forgiveness. There are those who are victims of, ab of abuse, I think some of those of you who have studied into that area realize that victims of abuse often feel guilty because they think that they have caused the abuse. It's a really perverted uh, kind of thinking that takes place. And we need to understand, well, who's guilty and what am I guilty of and what do I need to change? I've mentioned this to you before, but I think it's appropriate to remind you at uh, this particular time. It's a book entitled, Don't Let the Jerks uh, Get the Best of You, Advice for Dealing with <laughs> Difficult People. I think we all need that book by Paul Meyer, uh, MD. But he gives the example of two young men who were in a uh, seminary. They had perfectionist parents who were never satisfied with their, their conduct. 
And so they expected too much of themselves. They both erroneously thought God expected too much of them also because they confused the true God of the Bible with their father projections. And they became depressed. They became clinically depressed. What happened was that both young men had become subconsciously angry and bitter at God because he, the God, was demanding too much of them. Actually, they were displacing their anger from their perfectionist earthly fathers to their heavenly father. The seething anger that consumed Pete and Joe depleted the serotonin in each young man's brain. Serotonin is a natural chemical found in the synapses or spaces between all of our brain and nerve cells. When we think or move, serotonin moves from cell to cell across the synapses and transmits the proper messages. And since our brains run on serotonin like a car runs on gasoline, both men ran out of gas, quote, end of quote, mentally and emotionally. When we become bitter, our brain dumps serotonin into the bloodstream and is broken down into byproducts that are lost in elimination. When this occurs, we suffer from the classical symptoms of depression, insomnia, decreased energy, decreased concentration, despair, headaches, and thoughts of suicide. So what Dr. Meyer has found out in their clinical studies in working with so many depressed people was to help them not to let the jerks get the best of them and to understand how did I get into this state where I feel guilty. And what he goes on to say is when the patient gets proper therapy, this is page 170, and truly forgives his brain is able to hold on to the serotonin that his body produces naturally from a chemical called tryptophan found in foods like bananas, milk, fruit, and whole grains. A patient can be depressed for many years, then forgive the one who caused his repressed anger and totally recover from the depression. Forgiveness can make a huge difference in one's life. Because the serotonin has been restored naturally and the brain is able to work correctly. Now, I hope that all of us can forgive. We've heard sermons about it. Mr. Meredith has been emphasizing it. Uh, we heard about it in the, his inspiring sermon last week as well. But we, if we are committed for the Passover, we need to be committed to accept God's forgiveness when we truly repent of our own sins and be willing to forgive others. Let's turn to uh, Romans, the second chapter. We have to confess our sins, and, but we must understand that forgiveness is based on repentance. Uh, Romans, the second chapter, verse 2. That means we have to acknowledge our sins, and of course, as it says there in 1 John, if we say we don't have any sin, we are liars, and the truth is not in us. Romans 2, verse 4. Despise you the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Well, oftentimes we uh, accuse, falsely accuse others of our as being the cause of our own problems, when we ourselves are the cause of our own problems. We have to come to acknowledge our own human nature and be able to recognize it. But God gives us the ability to repent after we experience love and your love towards others, your children, your parents, your friends, can effectively bring them to repentance or because why? Because you are reflecting God's goodness. If you respond the way Christ tells you to respond, doing good to those that despitefully use you, how many of us, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, how many of us have done good to those that has despitefully used us. You know, my parents were very patient with me over the years. And, and uh, really, when I was around, I think, 26 or 27, I mean, God granted me repentance to look back on my parents' life towards me and to see how they had given me unconditional love. They had been kind to me decade after decade until 25 or 26 and to understand their unconditional love, contrasted with my sinful nature in life, brought me to a deeper repentance. 
That's what he says here. Do you not know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? So as we approach the Passover, let's look at our own lives, be willing to repent, be willing to forgive others, and be willing to accept God's forgiveness. And of course it tells us in Matthew 6, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Number two, after being willing to forgive ourselves and being committed to forgive others, number two is to be committed to avoid spiritual weakness. Turn to Hebrews, the second chapter. Avoid spiritual weakness. Now, of course, the positive side of that is to grow spiritually, grow spiritually strong. Hebrews, the second chapter, and verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip, or as the margin has, run out like leaking vessels. Uh, how do we hear? Do we really uh, review what is being said? Or do we just totally reject what's being said because it doesn't interest me? Or do we understand this may be God speaking to me through His Word, through an article, through the Bible, through His ministry, and maybe I better listen. We don't want to let them run out like leaking vessels. I remember uh, vividly, of course, when you're new in the church and you have that first love, you, you're really enthusiastic. And uh, I remember my first uh, Passover uh, flying from uh, Norfolk, Virginia, where I was working as a transportation engineer up to New York. And in those days, we were observing uh, the... Uh, had services every day, and we met, I believe it was in the Diplomat Hotel in Manhattan, New York. And I just uh, rented a room in the hotel, and I'd just come down the elevator and attend uh, the meetings, and I would take copious notes, and then afterwards, after fellowship, I would go back up, I'd get on my knees, and go over those notes. And because I was new, and I wanted to learn, and I wanted to make it a part of me. And as we become uh, veterans, we kind of lose that kind of diligence and care in trying to make sure that we understand and that we are committed to what God is giving us. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, verse 3 is a strong warning to us, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. We're warned about neglect. And we can become neglectful because we are distracted by the world and by our own cares of the world. Remember even the parable of the sower about those who were, the seed didn't grow because of the cares of this world. And we have to have those priorities dedicated, that we know what is important, that it's most important for me to get on my knees every morning, and uh, even if I only have a minute, I'm late for work, I've got to rush off, well, at least get down on your knees for a minute and pray for protection as you're rushing to try to make your late date or your late appointment. You know, you've got to make sure what is most important. You ask God for protection. I remember when we were doing the World Tomorrow television programs, we had uh, an interview with a prisoner one time who was uh, a regular subscriber to Tomorrow's World magazine. He said, you know, I, I feel naked if I go out into the prison community without having prayed in the morning. You know, he felt that he needed to be clothed spiritually, and the way he did it was by praying. And I hope that no one here, if you haven't learned that, Yet, I hope no one here ever leaves his or her home in the morning without ever praying. You are opening yourself to all kinds of uh, problems, and uh, you don't want to put yourself in a vulnerable, vulnerable position. Be committed to avoid spiritual weakness. Don't, let, don't neglect the benefits and the blessings that, that God is giving you. And, of course, that means a commitment, as you've heard in, in a Bible study and uh, your Bible studies and your prayer and your fasting and your meditation. And as I've told you before, I've changed my 
kind of routine normally. Uh, it doesn't happen every night because if I have a, an evening appointment and don't go uh, home, I may not uh, be able to do it as uh, I routine, routine, routinely do. After I get back from exercising, I'll um, change clothes and, and uh, get down, sit in the chair by the fireplace and make sure that I've uh, started reading the Bible as the new day begins at sunset. Well, I don't really keep it quite at sunset. I think, well, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, uh, 7 o'clock, I'm beginning, about to begin a new day. And I want to begin that new day with let, letting God speak to me uh, through His Holy Word, through the Bible. And it's just become more of a habit with me. And that I know some people are night people. They, uh, they don't really wake up until about 11 o'clock. And that's when they do their studying, their prayer. And so when they get up in the morning, they're still sleepy and they go off to work hoping that the evening prayer and Bible study from 11 to midnight will cover them for the morning, <laughs> morning time. We, we have uh, people that are night people, and we understand the difference in physiognomy and uh, chemical balance in, in individuals' lives, but we still need to be committed. And uh, again, the whole book of Hebrews is a warning. It's a priesthood book. But it gives us great warnings in Hebrews uh, 6 and Hebrews 10 about the unpardonable sin. Well, let's just read that again here in verse 3 of Hebrews 2. It said, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which is the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him? So commitment number two is to be committed to avoid spiritual weakness. And of course we do that by renewing God's Spirit, 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 and 7, by receiving God's power and growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ, 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Number three is to avoid bitterness. Again, some of these overlap. It's uh, very easy to get angry, uh, to hold a grudge. It's very easy to get bitter. Turn over to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. In fact, uh, I believe Mr. Partian gave a sermon on bitterness here a year or so ago. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Now again, all of these negatives, that is to avoid bitterness, have a positive side to them. What's the positive side? Right here in Hebrews 12, verse 14. Follow peace. If you're going to try to follow peace with all men, you can avoid bitterness. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness bringing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Again, bitterness is a terrible element in a person's life. It's something that just is right on the edge of committing the unpardonable sin. And that means, of course, the unpardonable sin is a sin that is unpardonable, unforgiven, but it isn't just the sin itself, it's the frame of mind. God will forgive any sin that a person uh, repents of. But you have to be careful that you do not ever get into the frame of mind where you're so consumed with revenge, so consumed with bitterness, that you cannot repent. Then you've had it. You have sealed your conscience for evil. And you must, and I must, be committed to avoid bitterness, or if we are affected by bitterness, to overcome it and to apply the antidote to bitterness, which is asking God to bless your enemies. Do good to those that despitefully use you. Pray for those that uh, persecute you. And I've done that. I know I, I remember one time well, I shouldn't tell the example totally, but I remember I really had a, I really disliked this other individual who was so arrogant, and uh, he was a, he was a leader, a student leader, and uh, I thought, oh, I just, I just had this grudge against him, and, and uh, it really was consuming me. It was hurting me more than it was hurting him, and I began to pray for him and pray, well, this poor guy, he's got some problems. And, you know, once I began to pray for him, it released me of that obsession. You've heard the expression, let go and let God. Well, let God take care of it. 
And once I prayed for him, I no longer had that obsessive uh, feeling of, uh, well, I got to get him, or he's got to, something bad's got to happen to this guy. Or, you, you know, you realize you can be objective and you realize, well, yes, he's arrogant, but that doesn't mean I have to uh, do the correction for him if it's not my duty to correct him. God can correct him. And uh, often as a minister, some of the problems we expect or that we experience that seem to have no practical solution, I just pray and ask God to handle it. And he does. God can handle any problem. He can solve any problem. But it's very important, that, brethren, as we read through the book of Hebrews, uh, that we avoid any root of bitterness as it's springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And it gives the example of Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And he sought uh, the inheritance, but he couldn't, uh, it was too late for him. We don't want to ever be in a state of mind where we can no longer repent. So follow peace with all men, without which no man shall see the Lord, verse 14, and avoid bitterness. And the antidote is to be praying for those who may be uh, the ones who have caused you problems or have abused you or persecuted you in the first place. Be a peacemaker. It says, well, while we're there, it's over the page, James, the third chapter, as a part of uh, number three, be committed to avoid bitterness and follow peace with all men. It says uh, here, the wisdom from above James, the third chapter, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Verse 18, are you a peacemaker? The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Number three, be committed to avoid bitterness. Number four, is be committed to overcome. And again, we will have these lessons emphasized and re-emphasized during the days of unleavened bread. When we read through all of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, we realize it doesn't matter whether you were uh, an Ephesus member or a member of Philadelphia, or just because you happened to be in that group didn't guarantee that you had salvation. Who is going to have salvation, regardless of the Ephesus attitude or era or the Laodicean era? He that overcomes will I grant to sit on my thrones, it says to the Laodiceans. And he that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, he says to the Philadelphians. So we have to be committed to overcome. That's a life commitment. And we know that we have to overcome the three basic enemies of self, Satan, and society. I think I mentioned in a sermon here a few weeks ago as we examine ourselves and learn lessons from the past year and lessons of life that I was uh, surprised that my wife asked me what one area of her life would I like to see changed or improved. And, uh, of course, as we prepare for the Passover, we want to know, examine ourselves, and see what should be changed. And I was surprised that she asked me, but I immediately <laughs> gave her something <laughs> to change. So I've been delaying the reciprocal approach. <laughs> and I knew that giving this sermon this morning, I had to ask her this morning. So I prayed about it. And I said, uh, "Hun, what one thing would you like to see uh, me change and improve in? And uh, she said, well, I have to pray about that. <laughs> <coughs> but thankfully, I was surprised. She started telling me three or four things that she appreciated about me. And I uh, thought, wow, what a wife. <laughs> but then she did but after th those three or four things she said but <laughs> and she did give me one thing to improve on so 
uh, I appreciate that very much. We have to be committed to overcome. Let's turn to Romans the 8th chapter. Of course, human nature, if, if you haven't discovered your own human nature, you must be on another planet. But I hope <laughs> that every one of you has understood that you have vanity, jealousy, lust, greed, selfishness. My uh, great-grandfather was uh, named Rutherford Burchard Hayes. He was uh, named after the uh, President of the United States at that time. But uh, I mention that because there's a quote by Rutherford Burchard Hayes on human nature. He stated he was President of the United States uh, and uh, 19th President of the United States, lived to uh, 1893. He said, wars will remain while human nature remains. Wars will remain as long as human nature remains. I believe in my soul in cooperation and arbitration, but the soldier's occupation, we cannot say, is gone until human nature is gone. We all have to replace human nature with, with God's nature. Now, uh, Romans the 8th chapter, I gave you a reference and I didn't even turn there. Romans the 8th chapter, which is the Holy Spirit chapter, just a wonderful, inspiring chapter that gives us hope and encouragement. We have to renew God's Spirit in us daily. He says in verse 37, as he discusses all of the problems of persecution and famine and peril and sword, verse 36, as, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37, know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We have to be conquerors, overcomers. And God gives us that power to overcome through his spirit. We'll be hearing more about that in the days to come and during the days of unleavened bread. Be committed to overcome, number four. Number four. Now, I might mention, I, uh, of course, we have to apply the uh, antidotes to our enemies. And uh, Mr. King, in his split sermon, was talking about uh, SQ and HQ. So we have to have a high spiritual quotient, quotient, quote, quotient. Quotient. Thank you, Mr. King. And uh, a high HQ, which is humility quotient. We appreciate those. Those are... Those are antidotes. Those are the power tools of overcoming our enemies. Number four was committed, be committed to overcome. Number five is be committed to endure to the end. In the Hebrews, the 12th chapter. In fact, the book of Hebrews is a good book to uh, be reading in preparation for the Passover because it emphasizes the great high priest that we have, who is Christ, Hebrews, the 12th chapter. We already just read uh, the latter part called the Correction with Love chapter is another uh, perspective. But verse 12, verse 1 and 2 of Hebrews 12. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Uh, who were that cloud? Of, what was that cloud of witnesses? It was all the great uh, patriarchs and the Faithful men and women, women and men of faith. Um, Sarah, as it mentions in verse 11 of Hebrews 11. And uh, these all died in faith, not having received their promises. Uh, verse 13, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. Um, talking about uh, David and Samuel and the prophets, verse 32. Uh, referring to Daniel, uh, even not, not by name, but stop the mouths of lions, the end of Verse 33, so these are the, the witnesses that we have, the men and women of faith. And since we have that cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience or endurance or perseverance the race that is set before us. So we are entered in a lifelong race and it doesn't end until our death or until Christ returns and we're changed from mortal to immortal at that point in time. We have to never give up, never slack off, but to keep persevering. And of course there are many, many sports figures, as you know, that 
uh, have uh, been an inspiration to us in the physical plane and level. I think of uh, several that come to mind, and uh, one uh, was the, what was her name? Anyway, she was the first black woman to uh, win a gold medal at the uh, U.S. Olympics. It was in 1960, and in fact, she run, went, won three gold medals. But she was one of 12 children, and when born with uh, polio or some kind of weakness in her legs, and her mother just took her and and had the uh, went, took her to the doctor. The doctor said, "Well, you've got to massage her legs every day." And so the other children took turns uh, massaging her legs, and pretty soon she was able to play basketball, and pretty soon she went to uh, high school later on, and was in the track team there, the Tiger Bell, Tennessee Tiger Bells. And uh, then finally uh, ended up in the uh, Olympics and won three gold medals. But she was from a poor family with physical handicaps, and yet she persevered uh, to the extent that uh, she won three gold medals in the Olympics. And there are many examples. You probably have some of your own personal heroes or heroines uh, that inspire you because of their perseverance. We can think about our brethren, those who died in the Milwaukee tragedy. We can think of our ministers and wives who have died over the past several years in the global church of God, in the living church of God. And we realize that they endured to their end. I can name a lot of names of people that are dear to me that have died. And we look forward to their resurrection. They persevered to the end, and they should be inspirations to us to persevere to the end as well. Let's turn to uh, 2 Timothy 4. Of course, it tells us in Matthew 24, 13, He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, and uh, verse 6, the Apostle Paul went through as we... I heard in the sermon last week, through many privations and persecutions, left for dead. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And that needs to be our goal. We need to have the vision of returning, of the returning Christ, that we love His appearing. We want to be able to say, as John says at the end of chapter 22 in Revelation, even so, come Lord Jesus. Are you that committed? I, when I asked my wife this morning, or yesterday I guess it was, I said, now, what commitments do you think we should make for the Passover? She said, well, we need to be committed to our Father in heaven, we need to be committed to Jesus Christ. We need to be committed to doing God's work. Reminded me of, uh, and I've told you this story before, but of a woman in, uh, I won't tell you where it was, uh, she was dying of cancer, and uh, in the local church area where I was pastoring at the time, this was a good 40 years ago, and uh, there were 33 women in the local church area that volunteered to help this dying woman day and night around the clock. And it came time for the Day of Atonement and she wanted to know, well, should I fast or not fast? And I uh, left it up to her. I didn't make any decision on whether she should fast or not. She was dying. And she decided that she would, not, she would fast on the Day of Atonement. She was the type of woman who before was uh, rather, uh, say, uh, aggressive. She would say to her husband, you know, buddy, you belong to me. She was that kind of a strong-willed woman. And I felt that it was important for me to visit her because I, God says we want to try to be perfected in one sense, and I the women had said that she, even though she'd gone through pain, she never shed any tears. And I thought, well, maybe that would be helpful. And I visited her and talked to her about how Christ 
with strong crying and tears was heard in that he feared and, and how David shed tears and how it would be helpful for her. She would be willing not to just keep in that, uh, that emotion but to be able to cry and to shed some tears. Well, I guess it was a couple days later and uh, on the Day of Atonement that uh, the lady said, you know, she really had a softer look in her eyes and, and uh, before she died, she called her husband over to her by the bedside and he leaned over and she put her arms around his neck so when he pulled up, she was able to be in a sitting position. And instead of saying, you belong to me, buddy, she said, I belong to you. Her whole attitude had changed. And I wonder just how many of you have ever said that to your Father in Heaven or to Jesus Christ. Have you ever said, I belong to you? Because it tells us, of course, in 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, uh, verses 19 and 20, that you are bought with a price, and that you are not your own. You're the temple of God's Holy Spirit. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are yours. We don't belong to ourselves. Of course, there's the expression, I'm my own man. Well, we can take that in different ways. But we need to understand and always understand that we must be committed to endure to the end. And we are committed because we are owned by, we belong to Jesus Christ and God the Father. Commitment number six, uh, number five, is be committed to endure to the end. Number six is to trust Christ to save you. Well, should we ever ask God to save us? Isn't that kind of selfish? Uh, of course, we, our, our purpose is to help others into the kingdom. And it means that greater love has this than no man, uh, greater love is no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, it says in John 15, 13. And so we want to sacrifice our lives as living sacrifices, as it tells us in Romans, the 12th chapter, <clears throat> so that we can help others into the kingdom. But there are times when we need to recognize our weakness and our need for a Savior. I might turn back to Psalm 6 and Psalm 7. I think of uh, David's emotion and his prayers. He was, uh, felt that he was being corrected, and he may have been uh, corrected through illness, where it seems to be the case here in Psalm 6. O Eternal, rebuke me not in your anger, nor chasing me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Eternal, for I am weak. O Eternal, heal me, for my bones are vexed. O soul, my soul is also sore vexed, but you, O Eternal, how long? Return, O Eternal, deliver my soul. O save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who shall give you thanks? So David asked God to save him. Chapter 7, verse 1. O eternal my God, in you do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Oh, you can ask that. Christ is your living, loving Savior. Mr. Meredith read that scripture last week in Romans 5 and verse 10. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. He is our living Savior. He knows you. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows your thoughts. But He's there as your great high priest and as your living Savior. So ask and trust Christ to save you. Let's turn to Hebrews, the seventh chapter. I think I've given this to you before, Hebrews the seventh chapter, but it's to me one of those comforting chapters. This is the priesthood book, remember? So talking about uh, Jesus who has an unchangeable priesthood, verse 24, Hebrews 7 verse 25, wherefore he is able also to save them 
evermore, or to the uttermost in the King James, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. So Christ is our living high priest. He's there every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day for you. He's there for you. Trust Christ to save you to the uttermost. And of course that reminds me of uh, Philippians, the first chapter, where he promises he will save us uh, to the uttermost or evermore, that he's not finished with us. And of course parents are familiar with the little cartoon and little child who seems like he's been corrected and the caption says, God's not finished with me yet. You know, don't, uh, don't give up on me. And that's what verse 6 of Philippians 1 indicates, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You've got that promise that God will not leave you nor forsake you. He's going to work with you. And part of that process may be painful. Some of it will be a challenge to your faith and a challenge to, uh, as we've uh, talked about here recently, uh, cognitive uh, dissonance, uh, where there's a kind of a, a, a gap in understanding and knowledge, and it tips your bubble. But if you go back to the fundamentals, as we heard in the first split sermon, go back to the basics, and you understand, as uh, David said, that he has more understanding than his teachers, because God's laws are absolute. And they give us the foundation for truth and what's right. So number six is to trust Christ to save you. The final commitment we need to consider before the Passover is be committed to support God's work. And I'm sure most of you are, but it's an appropriate time to remind us to be supported to support, be committed to support God's work. We... Uh, Turn to John, the fourth chapter. You know that one by heart, I'm sure. But we had the living leadership uh, class number three last week and uh, characteristics of a godly heart. An excellent Bible study, which we all appreciated. And number two of the characteristics of a godly heart was it is intensely focused on God's work. So again, uh, that is a part of a leader's heart, a godly heart that's focused on God's work because we want to do His will. Reminds me of the uh, scripture, I delight to do your will, O God. Uh, do you delight to do God's will or you just try to, um, well, it does take character to do things you don't want to do. Uh, but as you grow in maturity, you understand there are benefits for doing God's will and it is a delight. You enjoy doing it. I remember one time uh, one of my friends at uh, college, he was a, he was a senior, uh, vice president of the student body, I believe he was, and I think it was my freshman year, and he was telling me the story about how he didn't like to study the Bible. Uh, but a uh, senior told him, well, what, we, what you need to do is commit yourself to read the Bible an hour a day. You won't like to do it, but commit yourself to do it. And uh, as you begin to study it, then you'll begin to like it. And so I had the same kind of frame of mind. I didn't particularly like to study the Bible, but I committed myself an hour a day. And the first day, I, you know, after about 45 minutes of it, I thought, well, maybe this is interesting. and Maybe I'll begin to like this. But as time went on, I began to enjoy it and like it because God can give you the desire to even do His will. And uh, I've given you that scripture before, but it's such an incredible scripture. It has to do with your character. It has to do with Galatians 2.20. Uh, let's get to that. I'm giving you two or three different uh, points here, but let's first of all look at John 4, verse 34, and then I'll Turn to the other point I'm just giving you. John 4, 34, Jesus said unto them, My meat, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. 
And here's this harvest. Don't say that there are three months. The fields are already white to harvest. And if you go into that harvest, we're all going to rejoice together, both though he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together, verse 36. But Christ felt a commission and a mission and a dedication, an energizing attitude because he knew what he was doing and knew the benefit of his work. And we know the benefit of our work. Well, Daniel 12, 3, that we are to turn many to righteousness. And God's work is turning many to righteousness. And the comments we receive, if we've um, read here in uh, Sabbath services and the announcements and time to time, just so inspiring, so encouraging. And here's a man in Baghdad, a man of the uh, Armenian church that gets the Tomorrow's World telecast and responds to it. A man down in Tierra del Fuego at the very tip of South Africa, South America, who is now doing the translation for the Spanish work and who actually works with the website for the Spanish language. Where is he? The end of the world down in the, the south end. Uh, how far south can you get except if you go to Antarctica, you know, down at the end of South America. Well, this is a, a universe uh, serving work, not just a global work, but it's, a, it's going to eventually mean the whole universe. And so we are thankful for that work. Now, I used to, in classes, have a digression upon a digression upon a digression. Oh, I'm okay. I, I want to give you that very important. I haven't forgotten that particular point. Philippians 2 and uh, verse 12. Philippians 2 and verse 12. So as we are committed to support God's work, it should be energizing and motivating. And as we heard in the first split sermon, we need to read the writings of God's ministers in the work. Philippians 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And, of course, this is a little difficult for the grace people, uh, that is, uh, the grace or law people rather than grace and law, uh, because any active verb like this seems to mean, well, you're, you're uh, getting salvation by works. But you have to read the next verse. You have your part in creating or cooperating with God to create in you His perfect character. That's why we read, we sang Psalm 51 earlier in the service today. And David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. He was asking God's participation in creating in him godly character. And so we have to do our part. But verse 13 is an amazing verse. For it is God who works in you both to will and and to do of his good pleasure. Now, you have to be honest with yourself, like I was, had to be honest with myself. Well, I don't like to study the Bible. Be honest with yourself. If you have a problem, admit it. And ask God to change your will, that you can enjoy studying the Bible, for example, whatever the problem may be. But God can give you the desire to do what's right. For God will work in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Again, it's Galatians 2.20, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27. Uh, so I would encourage all of you, brethren, to mark uh, those verses and uh, realize how powerful they are. But we have a, a mission to perform. We have, uh, as you know, many different uh, programs going on. We're working now more powerfully with the Internet. In fact, uh, our latest uh, Tomorrow's World magazine, the March-April issue, which I presume all of you have, has the announcement on the back page of our going on the Internet with the Bible study course April 1st. So God is opening doors, the latest co-worker letter, and we hope that you again pray for the open doors. Mr. Meredith announces in the March 13th co-worker letter, 
of the new stations we have, uh, WBPX, a new one in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, with nearly two million households, uh, the Word Network that you're familiar with now, with over 42 million households across the United States, and an additional uh, satellite transmission to more tens of millions uh, over uh, the United Kingdom, Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Australia, and Central America. Now we're going on three new stations. Uh, that is San Diego, Cox Media Channel 4, which reaches a half million homes. Uh, KDOC in Anaheim, we've been wanting for a long time uh, to get back into the Los Angeles market. And uh, that reaches uh, 4.5 million homes. And not uh, mentioned in here since Mr. Meredith wrote this, I think it's uh, since you wrote this, uh, we're going on in a, a station in St. Louis. So Christ is opening the doors. And we appreciate your enthusiasm, your love for God's work. As I've encouraged you before, as an ambassador for Christ, and as a witness, and as a light to the world, to God's work, I hope you all know in your local area, I think most of you are from here, but some visitors, you need to know the station number, the channel, the time that Tomorrow's World telecast is on the air, so you can tell someone about it. And you're familiar with uh, the magazines, you're familiar with the booklets, you're familiar with the uh, Bible study course. And now that we're going on the internet, but we still have the hard copies of the Bible study course, where we've combined four lessons into one. And this is accelerating people through the uh, growth process. They're going through the lessons much more quickly now, with four in one lessons. And uh, again, when I asked how many of you are taking uh, the Bible study course, I was a little disappointed when I took a survey, but I was very encouraged to find out how many of you had already completed the Bible study course. So that was very, very encouraging. Well, here, brethren, we have the Passover coming up very soon. We need to consider the commitments that we make because the covenant that Christ makes with us is a formal agreement, and we are bound by that agreement. We understand what it means. It means that we belong to Him. It means that His shed blood pays for all of our sins and continues to cleanse us, as it says in 1 John 1, verse 7. And we know that His broken body, His beatings, His scourgings are for our healing, for it's by His stripes that we were healed. So as we think of the six and a half billion men, women, and children on earth, we understand that God loves every single one of them. We know how many are oppressed and why God's kingdom needs to come because of the wars and the rapes and the, the oppression and the wickedness and evil that's so rampant all over the world. And God has called us to be the lights of the world. He's called us to be His pioneers of the new covenant. And so as we prepare for the Passover, let's consider those seven commitments. Be committed to accept God's forgiveness and to forgive others. Be committed to avoid weakness and on the positive side grow in spiritual strength. Number three, to be committed to avoid bitterness and on the positive side to follow peace with all men. Number four, to be committed to overcome be conquerors, that we're more than overcomers through Him that loved us, to be committed to persevere and endure to the end, to run the race with patience and endurance, to trust Christ to save us, number six, and number seven, be committed to support God's work. So as we rejoice in the spring festivals, let's remember to renew our commitments. Let's remember to tell our Father in heaven and to our Savior Jesus Christ, I belong to you.